and hi everyone welcome to carpentry con at home fireside chat it's been seven weeks and uh, this is one of the very last sessions of the conference and it's really great to have all 27 of us on the call today um, so we are going to start by a quick round of introductions um, and then we will and then we will continue on with the theme of, of this fireside chat. Uh, Christina, I need permissions to share my screen. Coming right up. Thank you. <laughs> if you haven't yet, please sign in uh, in the etherpad. Also in line 49, you will see that there is a question, line 50, um, for a discussion at some point in this 90 minutes so you can start to look at it and think about it um, and we will have time for discussion okay, okay. Um, I you should have the powers now I do <laughs> um, so we're going to start by introducing the panelists and then we will go on from there um, so first I'll call on Toby yeah, hi everybody. Uh, I'm Toby Hodges and I'm the curriculum community developer with the Carpentries. So I work with um, members of the Carpentries community who are developing new lesson material um, to try to help make that as easy and enjoyable for them as possible, I guess. Um, I am as we were joking about earlier, also that 35 year old guy that still listens to punk rock. Um, and uh, yeah, I'll be making all the same jokes today that I did yesterday. So sorry if you've attended both sessions. Um, thank you, Toby. I forgot to say that I want all panelists to share the most recent thing that made them laugh out loud. Um, and so uh, the panelists will um, voice the the um, experiences or the things that made them laugh out loud. But then for everyone else on the call, feel free to type down in chat so that you can all shine your joy. So Toby, go. Yeah, that's right. Thanks, Sarah. So mine is still uh, the time the other day when my son managed to dribble up my nose. Um, that made me laugh a lot. Um, and I guess it says something sad about me that I haven't laughed out loud again since. Well, that's fine. I, I like that you're holding on to that. And thank you for sharing that with us. Um, Marlene. Hi, uh, can you hear me? Okay. Yes. Okay, perfect. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Marlene Mangami. I am uh, the vice chair and a director at the Python Software Foundation um, for the board of directors. Um, I'm also the current chair of PyCon Africa, which is just the annual gathering of the Python community on the continent of Africa. Um, and I'm very interested <laughs> in communities and gro growing software communities and um, particularly African software communities as well and seeing how that can have a positive impact um, on the continent. Um, Something that made me laugh recently, I watched, I recently watched a movie called The Princess Bride. That was just, I don't know why it took so long for me to watch it, but it's such a good movie. And I was just like, I was laughing the entire time. So I would recommend that movie for anyone. Yeah. That's high praise. It's good to have you on the call, Marlene. Um, Steph. That's better. I'm Stephanie Butland. I'm the community manager for R OpenSci. Um, R OpenSci fosters a culture that values open and reproducible research. We are home to over 400 staff and community contributed software tools in the R programming language. And we're part particularly well known for our open and collegial system for software peer review and a very what we think is a welcoming, <clears throat> uh, welcoming community that works with kindness. My personal superpower is I feel like I'm good at helping people recognize themselves and what value it is that they have to bring to a project. Um, for anyone here who is wondering, community management really is a legitimate emerging career um, mm. in science and technology. Um, so I came to this through academic science, um, you know, 
it's an emerging career. There's not a direct path. You don't study for this in undergrad yet. Um, so I came to this from academic science through project coordination work in science, and then found my calling uh, as a community manager four years ago with our open sci. So I'm proud to have a GitHub sticker on my dirt bike and a Kawasaki sticker on my laptop. Um, and the last thing that made me laugh out loud was just last night, I was doing like a recreational agility thing with my dog in my neighbor's backyard. Mm -hmm. And it was a total fail. The first time I screwed up and I like, I changed my strategy and I got in the way. And then the second time we got a do over and she just like stood and sniffed the grass. But it was actually wonderful and hilarious. So, yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much, Steph. Um, and next we have, oops, Naomi. Hi everyone. Thanks, Sarah. I'm Naomi Penfold. I'm currently the community manager at eLife. Um, a maternity cover for uh, my really good colleague. Um, eLife is an open access online journal and it works in the life sciences. So what I've done uh, with eLife is to support early career scientists mm -hmm. uh, because we want to advocate for openness and transparency and collaboration, but that can be asking for some tough things for people as they're trying to advance their careers in a actually quite a capitalist structure and competitive structure. So I work with those um, researchers um, and uh, I'm really pleased to be here today and to meet you or re-meet some of you. Um, what makes me laugh? Most recently, I was sat at a dinner table with my niece and nephew last week and we listened to a podcast called Ask the Nin Nincompoops. And it's amazing. There's these two, two adults who were giving answers to very legitimate questions like, why do we have trees? And oh, where is how is, who invented cheese? Um, but they come up with improvised, funny answers. Um, and I don't, you know what? I think I might start listening to the podcast myself. It's intended for kids. I don't care. It made me laugh out loud. It was brilliant. So I recommend that one. And thanks for having me. Amazing. It's really good to have you, Naomi. And I'm up next. My name is Sarah Rono. I am Director of Community Development and Engagement here at the Carpentries. Um, so I work with our communities to think about um, the needs that they have and how we can help to strategize to build those um, as we continue to um, build communities around computational uh, skills um, for researchers and librarians around the world. Um, I enjoy being in nature and that's a photo of me in Oslo a few winters back um, hiking up um, the trail by the river to the source of Oslo's water, which was really cool. Um, something that made me laugh out loud most recently. Um, so I follow this movement on Twitter. It's called We Want Plates. It's a group of people <laughs> who protest uh, when food is served on anything other than plates. And so there's some really funny pictures there. There's photos of, you know, prawns served on high heels and things like that. Um, yeah, so go find it and scroll and you will laugh out loud too. Okay, so it's really great to have everyone on the call and thank you to everyone who's shared in chat um, what the things that have made you laugh out loud recently. So we are going to start and I think the start of our conversation today is going to be around community building. Um, and my first question is for Steph. Um, I want to know what are some of the strategies to bring together seasoned community members and new community members together in communities and especially online. Um, and for the purposes of our conversation, uh, we will define community very broadly to be a group of people who come together to work towards a shared goal. So what are the strategies we can employ to bring together people who've been in a community for very long and those who've just joined the community um, so that they can collaborate and work together effectively um, and especially in online spaces? Steph. Thanks, Sarah. Um, I can think of two examples and then people can kind of generalize how they might apply these things. Um, one thing that we did running our unconferences is that we would have somewhere around 60 people attending but as a rule there would be, um, I'm trying to think which the one-third and the two-thirds, I think like either one-third or two-thirds were you know people who had never attended before mm -hmm. and one or two-thirds of the people, <laughs> I don't remember the proportions, um, were people who were 
um, had attended one previous unconference. And the rule was you could never attend more than two. Mm. Um, and so, because there was very much like familiarity with the community and our work, but also the vibe, you know, the code of conduct, the way people communicate with each other, the working in groups, the figuring out how, what you're going to work on and just mm -hmm. that comfort level. Um, it was having new people fully integrated for this two day thing with people who had done this before. Um, and then the other thing I think of is just, is not just, is pairing people mm -hmm. when they're working on something. So um, one thing that we do is when people volunteer to review a package for our open sci um, in the new reviewer form that'll be released soon, you know, people can say, yes, I would really appreciate some coaching and how to do this. Now the coaching comes from the editor, but the idea is um, we might pair a more experienced reviewer with a first time reviewer and that mm -hmm. kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, I guess the other thing I try to do as a community manager is really uh, revealing examples. So when people publish blog posts about things, you know, we right. have a few blog posts that are written by first time reviewers saying, I really didn't think I could do this, but I could. And here's what I learned or here's what I appreciated about the process. So having people reveal their experiences as first timers lowers that sort of anxiety level for other people to do it. Amazing. Thank you for sharing that, Steph. Um, and so as we can all imagine, when these two groups of people come together, people who've been in a community for very long and people who've just joined, um, there's been, you know, old ways of working or um, established ways of doing things in the community and new people come with new ideas. Um, and so friction might ensue naturally. Um, so my question for you, Toby, is, um, how can, you know, these groups of people working together um, cultivate kindness as they go along um, in these communities? Yeah, so um, I've, in the past, I have worked in places where, like, it's clearly considered uncool to show enthusiasm or like positivity about things and instead the sort of de facto attitude is a kind of um jadedness and cynicism that um mm. the it can be kind of intimidating to break out of if you want to um mm -hmm. and what i found in those circumstances is the um is the if you put yourself out there and are actually enthusiastic and try to get things done that are beyond the kind of bare minimum that might be expected of you, then other people tend to kind of follow that example. Yeah. Um, and so I kind of brought that experience into more recent work in like community management to also try to do the same thing of like modeling the kind of behavior that you want to see in terms of being kind to people and like reaching out and showing displaying empathy and encouraging people to talk about things that they're struggling with, for example. Mm -hmm. And I think I found that that kind of modeling of the behavior that you want to see, um, helps to encourage other people to do the same. Mm -hmm. I'll say that that on its own isn't enough. It's important to be explicit about your expectations for yeah. behavior to mm -hmm. have things like codes of conduct. I think yeah. in this community, we don't need to talk about it so much, but I've spoken to a lot of other people who are still of the opinion that they don't need to write a code of conduct until mm. someone's done something that would have been against it, if you see what I mean. Yeah. Um, but I think it's important to have these things in place right from the start. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and yeah, model that behavior that you wanna see in the world. I completely agree, Toby, um, because then the people who are modeling good behavior um, might be might encounter so much friction along the way, um, and that might, you know, affect them negatively. And so codes of conduct help to protect everyone in the community and ensure people are doing um, things in the way that is expected um, of them. And so Naomi, I have a question for you because codes of conduct are really important. Um, and from some of our experiences, it takes years to get it right. Um, how can someone who finds themselves um, in a position where they have to lead a community, um, there's no code of conduct, there are no resources, so people or money, or even the time to put together a, um, a code of conduct in the way that other established communities have been able to, 
um, what can they do? How can they put a code of conduct together quickly? I think this is such an important question to ask. Um, mm -hmm. And I would uh, start by saying that even there's some organizations I really look up to who've spent a lot of work on codes of conduct and they still have questions remaining. They're still learning, they're still working on it. So mm -hmm. I don't think we're at that place that we have the perfect answer. Right. Um, my experience has been that there's a lot of people who, with embodied knowledge, who are willing to talk about this. There's a lot of mm -hmm. things that can't be shared. Mm -hmm. um, background of codes of conduct development um, and I have uh, received a lot of help from other people when writing mm -hmm. my own codes of conduct and I would um, recommend for anyone to reach out with people who can afford to give some of their time freely to do that if you don't if you're not in a position to pay for somebody there are excellent people you could pay out there but if you're not in that position there's a lot of people that you can reach out to for advice and support. I think mm -hmm. Abby said yesterday about um, there being lots of codes of conduct online that are openly licensed and you can reuse. Um, if you do go down that route, I would highly recommend that you like really think about what you're reusing because if you're the one writing the code, you're probably also the one responsible for enforcing it. Exactly. You need to understand what it is that you're putting in place and you need to mm -hmm. understand whether the community you're working with understands it and agrees with it um because there's nothing worse than the stressful situation of thinking that you've done what you needed to do and then <laughs> realizing mm -hmm. that it's not enough and it's even more stressful if something does happen um so yeah i just advocate for people to reach out for help and ask the questions of the people around them and ultimately you'll you'll hopefully be linked to someone who can help you or a few people who can help you think it through um, mm -hmm. for your position Amazing. Thank you so much, Naomi. I like that you mentioned the responsibility that comes with enforcing codes of conduct and how important it is to think about that whole process as you start to write one. Um, I want to ask, and this is a question for everyone, in case you know some of these codes of conduct that are great um, for people to, a great starting points for people, either for conferences or everyday community activities, please share them in chat so that we can all have those resources at hand. Thank you, that's really great. And so we've talked about codes of conduct um, and, and you know how people can start to find those if they're new to community building and they find themselves in need. Um, so Steph, I have a follow-up question for you. Community building in general is hard work. Um, and there's a, there a question from a community member who said, um, I feel like I am making things up as I go. Are there resources out there that I can use? Um, so aside from the code of conduct ones, what other resources exist that community builders, old and new, um, can tap into? Um, yes, uh, I wanna start by acknowledging and saying that it is really hard work. Mm -hmm. um, and sometimes it's perceived as not such hard work. Yeah. Um, I did hear um, some of the people in a previous Carpentry Con at Home session talking about how um, it's easy to get things started, but once things are rolling, the sustainability mm -hmm. is, is hard. So acknowledging that if people are experiencing this, this is what you know expert supposed community managers are experiencing as well. Um, and there's such a variety of tasks that need to happen. So I have um, one, there are things and there are people as resources. So there's something called the Center for Scientific Collaboration and Community mm -hmm. Engagement. So the CSCCE um, is a community of practice of science community managers. Um, and a few people on the call today on the, and on the panel are familiar with this. Mm -hmm. um, one of the easiest ways to sort of get exposed to this community and have this like low barrier to checking them out is uh, by attending a community call. Mm -hmm. They're usually monthly um, and you'll immediately get the feeling that they're like friendly and they laugh and they have smiles on their faces and this kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, and you might see someone like Naomi there, Sarah, Toby, there's oh, Malvika, I think. Other people attend these as well. So you know the people yeah. who are there. Um, thank you, Toby, who has just added, uh, I think, both the URL to the community as well as a link to join the Slack. Um, so what you get there is not just, you know, attend the community call. There are tons of written resources about um, models for community participation. So you can kind of get a sense of, 
it's not just, you know, sometimes you're sending out newsletters and sometimes mm -hmm. you're organizing big events. How do you put these things together? Mm -hmm. um, and in the Slack, what you get is access to a bunch of people who all admit they don't know all the answers, but when you ask a question, they will tell you, you know, in my experience, this is what worked. In my experience, this is what was a total fail. So right. it's a really supportive group of people. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing, and I'm pleased that Naomi is on the call for me to say this, the other thing I recommend is find your Naomi Penfold mm. <laughs> and your Steffi Lizert. So Steffi Lizert is my co-author um, on an Our Open Sci Community Contributing Guide that we just released. Um, and Naomi knows that I was like really, really having a hard time with this project because it was like big and complex. And how do you write down mm -hmm. all the things you think and know about your community so that other people understand it? Um, and when Steffi became my co-author, she asked me the tough questions. And so it was like somebody who gets you, understands the project, um, is willing to ask questions, but nobody feels threatened by this. So that's a wonderful relationship. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm big on sort of relationships where people help each other in this kind of thing just by listening and talking. Um, Naomi and I now have just about weekly two hour remote co-working sessions. Mm -hmm. We don't work for the same organization, but we understand a whole lot of the issues that each of us deal with. And so the remote co-working goes like this. We have a scheduled time. We spend the first sometimes five minutes, sometimes 15 minutes talking about like the roller coaster, of like, hey, how's it going this yeah. week? What are you having trouble with? Um, and then we say, okay, what's the big picture of project that you are planning to work on in the next two hours? So we talk about the big picture and then, okay, so in the next 25 minutes, what would you like to accomplish? We set a timer um, and we turn off our video and we turn off our mute. We actually meet in Zoom, but we stay in the Zoom meeting, turn those things off. Mm -hmm. We work away for 25 minutes. The timer goes, we come back. I was like, okay, how was that? Sometimes it's like, oh, I can't believe I finished what I was trying to finish. And another time um, it will be, you know, there's one time in particular where I was working on a big project and I've got this big document and I'm trying to decide how do I convey the content and the strategy to the staff team, but also get their input. It was just too much and I say too many words. And so I would just overwhelm them and not get what I want. And Naomi was able to, sometimes she'll ask me questions, what mm -hmm. do you want and what about this or give me suggestions. And that was one of the times it was just like a really a breakthrough time where the next day at the meeting, I was totally on, I absolutely, uh, it, was, it was great. Um, and sometimes it is the emotional, psychological support of like, man, I am really struggling with this project. So she's seen me all the way through this big project I've been working on to like, yes, we released it. Um, mm -hmm. So we celebrate with each other and we support each other and we're on different parts of the roller coaster at different times. So it's kind of cool. Um, so I, Toby is being great about adding these links. Um, so Naomi and I wrote a blog post about this. There are lots of different flavors of remote co-working. Right. I highly encourage it. I think I saw someone say, um, you know, I need this. I would be happy to co-work anybody on this call um, if we're even remotely in the same time zone because Naomi's in Edinburgh and I'm on like the West Coast of Canada. We co-work once a week together. So I would absolutely be happy to do it with anybody here and I'm going to stick the link in the chat. Don't put it in the ether okay. pad, but I'm going to stick the link to co work <laughs> with me in the chat. Thank Amazing. You. Thank you, Steph. That's really great. Um, in a few minutes, I'll invite Mylene to um, speak on the health of communities and how to exercise community care as we work together towards our shared goals. But before we get there, um, I, I want to throw a question at Toby and uh, Naomi. Um, so someone asked, I would love to know how successful community managers balance their life with the work that seems to take everything that one has. How do you avoid the trap of there always being more than what, more, more that one could do? Maybe, can I go first? Cool, okay. Um, oh gosh, play, <laughs> play. I have learned the hard way, as I'm sure many people have, that you cannot just work all the time and not give yourself the joy of 
play and so I now go and do improvised comedy with a troupe in Edinburgh it's totally different I don't look at my laptop it's not work related it's creative it's different people I learned that tip from uh, Monica Granadas who runs a project in the open science space um, uh, and it's just been it's just been amazing like it's been as good as meds for depression oh. honestly it's been amazing so I think that's really important and the other thing I'd say is boundaries um, Toby uh, shows role models this really well um, it's this ability to know what your what you can bring what value you offer and prioritize that for the capacity and time you have because you cannot give yourself a hundred percent to mm -hmm. other people all the time and that's what community managers like you know we turn up for other people it's what fires us but we'll just run out of fuel if you just mm -hmm. carry on without sustaining yourself yeah. So I would strongly advocate it's not you're not a bad person if you say no you're not a bad person if you say not this time because you know what you need to do every week you know what you need to do every month um and what you need in order to also be a, a well-rounded person <laughs> with friends and family and joy in your life and things like that amazing thank you Naomi and Toby yeah okay so um everything Naomi said and um i i can add a few things i guess advice that was given to me by another carpentries instructor recently is to actively practice saying no to people mm -hmm. saying thanks very much for the opportunity but i don't have time uh, mm -hmm. or if you don't feel comfortable doing that and sometimes it can be really hard to actually say no i find it hard to say no to people to their face um at least practice saying uh, thanks very much for thinking of me. Um, before I commit to anything, I need to check my calendar um, to make sure that I don't have any other commitments that will get in the way of this. Mm -hmm. This is good because it gives you the time to actually go check your calendar, which is probably something that you ought to do. It doesn't do any harm. Um, and it also gives you the time and the space if you need it, like I often do, to compose that really nicely worded, polite email that actually says no to the person mm -hmm. that, uh, that asked you to do something. And I find that a lot easier, to be honest, than, than saying no to them in, in person, in the flesh. Um, I'll also add, I think, because we should talk a little bit about not only our responsibility to ourselves here, although that mm -hmm. is very important, but also the responsibility that we have to our community members. And you should remember that, first of all, if you aren't looking after yourself, it's you're not putting yourself in a position where you can look after the community that you're working with. Um, mm -hmm. And last night on the equivalent call, I gave a name check to Malvika, but she's actually here today. So I get to um, wave at her. Hi, Malvika. <laughs> Malvika talked recently on Twitter, relatively recently on Twitter about um, not only like saying no to things, but also being proud of yourself as a community manager, if you're the type of person that people feel like they can say no to as well. Like if you present yourself in that way to your community, uh, you should feel you should feel proud of yourself for having done so. Um, mm -hmm. I have more to say on this topic, but I'm just going to throw more things in the notes. I think. Thank you. Um, I would really love for uh, um, people to read Malvika's uh, thread of tweets. It was really really great. So if someone can get us that uh, link, that will be really cool. Um, so Marlene, I uh, we've been talking about self care, um, and I'd really love to hear from you. Um, so the next two questions are for you. Um, the first one is, uh, what practices or skills uh, have you found most transformative in working with others as a community leader? And then I would like you to speak on, you know, the health of communities and how we can begin to think about community care and practice it more um, intentionally. Um, sure. Uh, so I think when I think of practices and skills um, for myself personally, I would 100% agree with what everyone has just said. And, um, you know, what Naomi said was also great as well in terms of trying to move out of the tech bubble sometimes is a great, <laughs> it's a really good thing. And for me, I try to at least once a week, um, you know, have a day where I'm just not doing anything tech related. I'm not doing anything work related at all. Mm -hmm. um, and that's been very helpful for me. I also try and meditate 
personally, um, not consistently, I'm not a fan, I'm not consistent with that, but it does help when I am consistent about it. Um, in terms of, uh, so that would be for self-care and 100%, I would agree with Toby in terms of saying no and, and learning to be able to do that. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of the larger broader community and encouraging care for our community, I think for myself, I have, you know, I think a really key part of that is trying to understand the community and the needs of your specific community. Right. Uh, I work a lot with the African Python community and also do some work with the American Python community. And they're very different. <laughs> they are very different communities, very different needs. Uh, some overlap in that, but they're, they are very different needs for the two communities. And so for me, I think I have tried my best to really connect with specific people mm -hmm. um, in certain communities, ask them, okay, what are the needs in your specific country? For example, someone was saying that uh, they're from a, fr a Francophone country and we hadn't actually addressed, um, mm -hmm. we hadn't actually been, all of our meetings had been in English mm -hmm. um, and we hadn't done anything French related at all. Um, so taking in that feedback and saying, okay, how can we actually um, care for this, this segment of our community? Um, it's very difficult to do that sometimes, <laughs> but yeah. I think um, actively engaging with your community members is a mm -hmm. great way to uh, find out what they need. Yeah. Amazing. I really like that. Um, and especially because active listening is such an underrated and important skill. Um, and it is really important for all of us to find opportunities to cultivate it uh, as we work with communities and go along. Thank you so much, Marlene. Um, and so you mentioned feedback. Um, and one of the questions we got from a community member um, is, um, I have very limited time for other activities after school and family time. I feel like I am missing out from the fun of being involved in volunteer work and the reward that comes with it, like a better resume. What does inclusion look like for people like me? Um, so Toby, I want you to speak on that. Um, yes. All right. Um, so I think that we, as speaking to the people here who are, who are like leaders in their community at least in some way i think that we have a responsibility to make sure that this happens like we we talked about this last night as well and everybody said things that were the responsibility of the person in the leadership position and not the responsibility of the person who wants to contribute i'll repeat mm -hmm. what i said last night to that person who wants to contribute that's great and i really hope that you're able to um and I think the ways in which we can make it possible for people to do that are through kind of documenting, ideally briefly, but still documenting properly the processes. And um, if you can kind of itemize specific ways in which people can contribute, um, mm -hmm. specific ways in which newcomers can contribute or people who already have some experience with the community um, and include with that, estimates of realistic estimates of the amount of time that it's mm -hmm. going to take to do that um mm -hmm. i think that that's certainly something that i haven't done so well in the past and that i've got better at doing mm -hmm. um i also think that we need to think a bit about what the unwritten rules are and processes are of our organizations because those are the kinds of things that make it completely inaccessible your project completely inaccessible to people who have limited time um think about why those things aren't written down, write them down if you can. And if you can't really interrogate why, what the justification is for having some process that you're not willing to write down for other people. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And Abby, I want to mention, Abby made a great point yesterday about if you, if you have this possibility for your project to adopt like a cadence for the project that makes it accessible for um, some time contributors who don't have a lot of time to put into it. For example, mm -hmm. if you can establish like a monthly release cycle, then those folks who don't have a lot of time to commit can, they know 
that they can come like plan to come and do some QA or something um, close to the release point um, and be involved that way. Um, Sarah, you mentioned last night as well, um, something that I think is really important about this, like getting credit for those contributions as well, that we need to make sure that we kind of publicly acknowledge those contributions, whether they're large or small or whatever, um, in a way that then those people can kind of point to on their CV or whatever uh, in the future. Yeah. And to show that we appreciate it, even if you can only spend 30 minutes on the project and not 30 hours. Absolutely. I really like the last thing you said, um, as, as people designing pathways of engagement in our different communities, we should also be very careful about how we communicate the weight that we place on different types of you know, engagement. So are you communicating that one pathway is more important or more valued than another? Um, I think you know, it's, it's really important to let people know that your 15 minutes, your one hour, whatever you can give is really appreciated in the community. Um, great, thank you so much, Toby. Um, and so a question for Naomi and Steph. Um, in big and established communities especially, what are some of the ways one can give every last community member a voice to make sure that they are heard and that they also feel heard? I'm gonna speak up only to say that I've mm -hmm. had plenty of airtime because I got to be on the panel yesterday and today. So I'd <laughs> like to sort of allow Naomi and then more time for Marlene to say what they would like to say. Okay, thank you, Steph. Oh, thanks. Um, I think uh, what you just said, Sarah, I'd like to build on that because there's, you know, for people's context, showing up and listening and then telling their friend is a huge contribution to uh, sharing practices amongst the community and it's so not visible. So people who step up and they're project leads or they've got this, you know, this written documentation online that's got their name next to it, um, that's citable, that's always much more visible than the people who are doing the networking and the speaking. And it may mm. just be, there could be people on the call today who turn up, who don't, who don't say anything in the chat, who don't, you know, don't have your videos on, but you are important too because you're yeah. listening might take something back you might think about something you might challenge one of us later to say hey and mm -hmm. that is really generative and so i think noting those different activities the invisible activities is really important um in terms of giving everyone a voice i've really um been very privileged to work with a group of early career scientists who are very international and and they're all operating in english but english is not their first language and um one of the things they do is to try to avoid um synchronous uh, spoken calls, right? Because in those calls, um, you're if you're if you're not there with your first language, you've got to do all the energy and time of translating, thinking about what you want to say, translating it back, and you've missed the conversation by that point. Mm -hmm. uh, they kind of organise these uh, what they call a virtual brainstorming kind of uh, event, but it's online in a forum, so you could write it, so you can take your time to write. We're still doing it in English, still got a way to go with other languages. Uh, but if you give people two days, you can still reach decisions in that time. Um, it's still quick, it's still like, you know, it's, it's as good as synchronous, but right. with, with text, everyone can contribute. No one's talking over. Right now I'm dominating the attention of what, 30 people? But if you're doing it in text, 30 people can write at once. Um, and so I think that little tweets like that with how you share and collect and, and discuss mm -hmm. information, I think are really important for those voices. Thank you, Naomi. Um, Marlene, um, are, there, are there any experiences and strategies we can borrow from um, PyCon Africa and also from um, the Python community around the world for how you know, different people get a voice um, and a platform to speak? Um, I think that 100%, um, I think that it's, uh, it's, quite, it's, it's quite difficult, particularly when you're working with a global community in a glo global context. Yeah. Um, I actually had not heard the idea of just uh, focusing mainly on text, and I think that's a fantastic idea. Mm -hmm. um, we, you know, for PyCon Africa, one of the, one of the major concerns when we were thinking about whether we should have the con move the conference online or not was that um, you know a lot of people don't have access to that fast internet connection that can allow you to stream 
um, 100% of the time. And it w- it, it's, I think for us, um, we made the decision to still go ahead and do some of the sessions live. Mm -hmm. but also making sure to follow that up with content that is recorded, you know, that there's going to be content on the YouTube page so that someone can pick out like a specific thing that they want to watch and they don't have to use all of their um, data bundles. If they're, if they're not using like a Wi-Fi connection, they can use like um, a certain amount of data to watch exactly what they want. Mm -hmm. Um, We also, um, you know, really tried to make sure we had a session um, right at the beginning of the conference where we asked community leaders from the smaller communities um, in different parts of of the continent to sort of give us a report back on what are the things that they're doing in their communities that are working well, Mm -hmm. um, the things that they would like to see as well um, from us. Um, And I think that feedback was was quite positive for us. Mm Um, it's something that I am not really sure, (laughs) um, how we could, you know, I think there's a lot of people that have their voice not heard and I'm, I'm still trying Mm -hmm. to figure out what the best ways to engage with those people are, but I think those would be my main (laughs) points. Amazing. Thank you, Marlene. I also wanted to mention that one of the things I really appreciated was, uh, when you selected speakers for PyCon Africa this year. Um, you you gave people the opportunity to pre-record their sessions in case their internet wouldn't be, you know, reliable on the day or they weren't sure if there was going to be electricity um, on the day. And so allowing people to pre-record um, so that they will be able to share their ideas and experiences um, either way, that was really great and I really appreciated that. Um, thank you. Um, so we have... I think about 40 minutes left to this call. And I think I would want us to discuss the um, round table question that I, I pointed all of us to. Um, so the question was, uh, and this came from community members. We had about four questions around this. Um, so soft skills or core skills uh, versus tech skills in um, open communities and online communities. Um, and how we value them, um, how they play out and the relationship between them. And um, I would like to hear from anyone really. So if you, if you want to speak on this, um, please raise your hand or type hand in chat and I will see it and call on you. Anyone? I don't see any hands yet. The question was, um, so we received quite a number of questions from community members ahead of this fireside chat. um, And the questions were around um, the value placed on technical skills um, in open communities and um, soft skills or people skills or core skills um, and how to bridge that gap between technical skills and um, core skills um, and you know how to manage the friction that you know so often comes up and um, you know especially around how to balance or where to place who and when Um, yeah Any of the panelists want to say anything? Sure. I mean, I will say I can comment a little bit. Okay. Um, I think, uh, you know, I think soft skills are still something that are, I think that for me, in my experience, I have felt, um, I sometimes feel that definitely more technical skills um, are appreciated a bit more, or I don't know if there's just like, I think for me, when I was first joining the Python community, for example, Mm -hmm. I was still learning a lot in Python and I was not confident in my technical skills, but Mm -hmm. I wanted to be in the community. I wanted to be there. I felt like I should be there. Um, But I, 
a hundred percent felt very like sometimes uh, I I think when um, there were more technical conversations happening or if I would feel okay maybe let me just contribute with soft skills um, I definitely felt sometimes that I it's kind of like the expectation is even if you are contributing soft skills you have to have a technical element to you as well mm -hmm. and that's not necessarily true I think that so many people can come into the community and just want to can contribute soft, like in, in terms of soft skills, just like maybe helping out with community organizing and things like that. Um, and I think that's okay. I think there's a lot of pressure sometimes to, uh, and I actually someone once told me that when I was still learning, they were just like, you, you need to learn how to code <laughs> at some, you need to learn how to get better mm -hmm. at Python. Um, and I felt like, there was an enormous pressure to do that. And I think we should remove that from people. Um, and that could be very positive. Yeah. I think I'd like to reframe the, the general question, because for me, the word technical, I don't really know what it means. And I think that there's skills that take you time and training and experience to get good at. And whether you're coding, that, that, that does that, but also learning how to do some of the things we're talking about with communities right now mm -hmm. also requires you to do that. And so I would argue they, would, they are technical skills. Like a good people skills person has a lot of experience and a wealth of training under their belt, right? So mm -hmm. I would classify that as technical. And, that, and that's not to diminish the tasks that haven't had that experience and training. Mm -hmm. We know that they're also really important. We all have to roll our sleeves up and do uh, the task that, you know, that a lot of us could do as well without that specialism. Um, and so I think I just, I'm just quite uncomfortable about the general question, but I understand where it's coming from. Um, and there's an element of the questions uh, to do with how do you, you know, how do you get the salary? How do you advocate for the money to be paid to do that kind of work? Mm. Um, and I think for me, that's still an open question and it can feel quite uncomfortable, but I'm trying to start reframing it, uh, reframing it is what's the value that doing that well brings. Like if you've connected two people, it suddenly means something happens. That is hugely valuable. It really doesn't matter if those two people have like tech skills individually, if they don't mm -hmm. do the project together and it doesn't bring that value, then yeah. if you're the person that's connected them, that mm -hmm. brings value. And I think it's about trying to articulate it in a kind of commercial sense, which feels very uncomfortable for some of us community or social justice people, but learning that language um, to communicate that, I think is really important. I'm still working on it. Thank you, Naomi. Um, Steph, you have a hand. Yes, <clears throat> and then I immediately blanked on the first thing I was thinking of, something related to something Naomi had said. Oh yes, that's right. And I have partly the Carpentries to thank for this. Um, until I became a community manager, I had never used Git or GitHub. Mm. So I have only gotten into that, you know, I thank my, Git, my GitHub sticker, my dirt bike is because I work as a community manager. Um, yes, I had done some like programming stuff in the past and data analysis, but um, I have to acknowledge too that I have some of this in myself in my job. So I am a community manager who is not an R programmer practitioner. And I know I'm capable. I don't doubt I'm capable. I just haven't chosen to become a software developer. Um, but I work with and represent a community full of both, you know, newer and more seasoned soft R developers. And there are conversations that like, I can read, I read text and I'm thinking, I kind of get a hint of what they're talking about, but I don't understand the issues deeply. And so it's hard mm -hmm. if I'm trying to work with these people and help and support and raise up their efforts. Yeah. I often feel like I don't understand the issues deeply enough to really be able to represent. Mm -hmm. um, and it's interesting because one of the later questions is about, you know, challenges that I have to deal with. It's like, I don't have the answers. The answer for me became, and I only actually, I only started feeling this maybe two years into my job. So in the beginning, it was like, I knew exactly what I needed to do. And then later, as I sort of got more mature in the community myself, mm -hmm. this was really starting to bother me. Um, and so I actually gave a talk about a year ago, as, you know, community manager joins her community. And it was talking about the things I'm doing to try to teach myself our programming mm -hmm. kind of in my spare time. Um, so it's kind of a big deal. I feel pretty tech savvy. Mm -hmm. but there's still this funny feeling about being the community manager without 
living deeply the way the rest of the people in my community do. Mm. Thank you, Steph. Um, that's very helpful. Um, I really like the conversation that's going on in chat about, you know, um, which is what Naomi was talking about. It's really important to frame um, these conversations right, because sometimes the wording we get uh, wrong is what keeps people away from even starting the conversation. In yesterday's call, Abby um, suggested professional skills. Um, as a term to use. Malvika suggests transferable versus computational instead. Um, so I really like that. Keep suggesting. Um, Christina has a hand. Yeah, I just want to chime in. I really like what Malvika wrote about transferable versus computational. I was in a workforce workshop last week and earlier this week, and it really um, focused my thinking on the fact that t what we call tech skills are often transient because they change quickly. And I, in a certain job, I might need to know about Python, but in a different job, I need to know about a different system, but that my professional skills are exactly what Malvika put in the chat, transferable. And if I know how to be a good team member and run good meetings, that's useful in any context. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that's been a, that's been, I'm slowly reframing that in my mind. And then also related to what Naomi said. Um, yeah, I think making these skills visible to ourselves, a lot of this is sort of invisible. It, it is invisible. So first making it visible to me and for me, even a process of like reviewing what I've done and identifying my own skills and being like, mm. oh, having been in some bad meetings and been like, oh, wow, I actually know how to run a meeting. Like that's something that I should, you yeah. know, include on part of my performance review or um, add to my resume or CV. Mm -hmm. um, and so that I can start to advocate for myself. Now that doesn't necessarily drive the systemic change of like employers hiring specifically for these skills, but at mm -hmm. least um, it makes them visible um, in a greater way. Mm -hmm. And yeah, so I appreciate everyone's everyone's thoughts on this. I also think about this a lot. Thank you, Christina. Um, and Renato says in chat, um, it's really interesting to think about this and um, to even start defining what constitutes skills under each of these categories. So um, yeah, I think we should definitely keep this conversation going um, and um, you know, actively think about what this means and what we can do about it, especially just to bridge the gaps and the misunderstandings that currently exist. Um, all right, I would like us to move on. Um, this, I've been looking forward to this question <laughs> since we started the call, um, and it's because it's a very important question, and um, I will call on Toby and Naomi to speak on this. Um, so the question um, is, is the climate crisis a topic of discussion in our communities? Uh, will this type of conference, so online conference, CapentryCon, seven weeks, um, will, will this conference have moved online for uh, the reason of you know, climate crisis? Um, or will the leaders of different communities think that it's not needed yet? Um, online events are difficult to manage, but hybrid ones are probably worse. What can we do in the future to not only be inclusive, but also be environmentally friendly? And how much greener are virtual platforms than transport to in-person conferences? Naomi, you should go first again, because I talked about, I got to talk about this last night as well. Um, I'm, I'm happy to offer some thoughts. Again, I want to like raise up uh, some work that's been done by some of the community members that I work with to look mm -hmm. at science conferences and what the carbon footprint was. They kind of, they looked at some major science conferences and thought about how many people went and where they traveled from, from the stats that they had. Um, and they've got some very interesting facts and figures out of this that conference attendance represents 35% of a scientist's carbon footprint on average, obviously, but across the world that's very different. Mm. And that, um, and the air travel of the nearly 7,000 people that went mm -hmm. to 
the American Association of Geographers in Seattle was basically the same as all of Haiti generated in 2014. And I think when you start to look at the numbers there, I mean, the movement against not flying to conferences has been going on for a long time and it's been gathering steam before uh, COVID-19 hit. And these people wrote a preprint about this before COVID-19 uh, came along as well. But I think um, there's always been, there's a, there's a wealth of in-person interaction there's oh there's a there's a value of it you know virtual conferences don't fully replace the value that people get from interacting uh together in the same space and i think that and also the fact that you'd have to change what you're doing in order to go fully online has always been mm. a block for people to fully convert and so one positive about this horrendous situation we're in is that people have had to they've had to do that energy change and, and start to work it out and i really hope that from that more people become comfortable um mm -hmm. with this kind of conference and i think that it yes it takes a lot to organize this we know how much work that you have put in christina sarah everyone here to do this it also takes a lot of work to do an in-person conference <laughs> it does. Might not see that <laughs> so it's work both ways um and i think that uh, it's totally possible to have more virtual conferences. Thank you, Naomi. This this is really cool. Um, the link you shared, um, and I encourage everyone to read it. And if you're so inclined to, you know, do the math and see what carbon footprint you've left behind so far, um, at least it puts things in perspective as you think about this. Um, Toby. Yeah. So, thanks, Naomi. Um, I'll add to those great points to say that um you know i hear people talk about this issue as though in-person conference setups are like the ideal standard that we should be aiming for and that we should be trying to like replicate that when we run things virtually and i don't know what in-person meetings those people have been attending um, but I certainly don't see these things as perfect in any way. And I think that as well as the kind of climate um, impact or lack of impact of, of staying home and attending things virtually, you should think about it as a like tremendous opportunity to make your events more inclusive as well. Not only to, you know, we can record talks at in-person conferences and upload them to YouTube or whatever. And that is really helpful. Um, but those in-person events are still really hard for a lot of people to attend, depending on the location. Um, you know, visa issues are a big problem for a lot of people. Um, taking enough time away from home and from like care commitments that people might have might be also excluding them from attending. Um, or, you know, there's also just a really significant financial like burden of attending these things as well that it's very easy for someone like me honestly to sort of forget about um and all of those things are swept off the board immediately if you decide to run your event virtual or if you decide to run a kind of hub and spoke model where you've got lots of simultaneous events that are happening in person um mm -hmm. that was something that we talked last night about the user conference that was what they were aiming to do this year until of course they had to run the whole thing virtually for reasons that it's not worth me mentioning um yeah and so use it as an opportunity to figure out how you can make your event more accessible to everybody in your community rather than like reinforcing the kind of privileges that led people to be t speaking at those conferences in the first place i think mm -hmm. amazing thank you toby um i've seen angelique in chat and i don't know if it's okay for me to put you on the spot angelique but i really would love for you to share um especially how before you had a budget um, to fund people to come to um, an in-person event and then you know when the pandemic came how you were able to re you know reuse those funds uh, channel them elsewhere in a way that still benefited people so that they were able to take part in your event oh, thank you so much Erin. not putting on the spot at all uh, I love talking about this and this is my silver lining. So a quick part of my job in the Carpentries, I'm the regional consultant for Southern Africa for the Carpentries, Angelique, based in Johannesburg, South Africa, hello all, is a, we um, arrange carpentry workshops 
Michael Sadilar, who's based at the Northwest University. And we have a budget allocated for accommodation and transportation for instructors to various sites in the country. Now, obviously with the pandemic, uh, we had a very hard lockdown. We couldn't move around, but I very strongly felt like we didn't want to stop um, the work of the carpentries in Africa and specifically Southern Africa. So we repurposed the uh, funds for travel and accommodation, et cetera, to mobile data support for those who were um, at home now, uh, were reliant on mobile data, which is quite expensive in South Africa compared to other countries in the continent, never mind Europe or America or Asia. And I'm very grateful that we had the opportunity to support instructors uh, and learners and also instructor training events as well with mobile data instead mm. of paying for transportation fees, et cetera. So that's the one point. And maybe just what I said in the chat, we had our call um, today, our African Carpentries monthly meetup, and we came to the discussion or to the conclusion that we could attend more conferences globally and mm. without the monetary strain and the, uh, the very weak currency we have on the continent. So this is a big plus for us. We could um, attend workshops in in the US, even though it might be midnight South Africa now, and that's fine because mm. we can now attend them where we wouldn't maybe be able to get a visa to attend. So that's just, yeah, I'm, I'm grateful for that. Thank you for the No problem, Angelique, and thank you so much for sharing. Um, I think that's a brilliant example. Um, there's a question in chat about um, whether anyone has experience with hybrid um, events so partly online and partly in person and so in case you do please raise your hand and i'll call on you um, because angelique has already touched on this i want to throw a question at um, marlene and maybe naomi um, so with a global shift towards online interaction how should we adapt to make sure people in countries without reliable high-speed video internet access um, are you know included or not left behind, uh, and what work needs to be done to make this possible? Um, sure, I think um, I loved what Angelique was just saying about um, transferring funds that people were going to use for travel to mobile data. I think that's that's really a great idea. I mm -hmm. wish I had thought of that and maybe given financial aid at the conference um, for um, mobile data because it is, it's very expensive, I would say, throughout the continent. And so that's a fantastic idea. Um, I think in terms of, uh, you know, reliability and, and things like that, you know, potentially, like I mentioned earlier, um, I would say 100 percent having pre-recorded talks is just to me I think is a great um, way for people to access the content that they want um, we also had a blogging team so that um, you know every talk that was given there was someone that was actually uh, taking notes from the talk and will publish you know those notes on our blog a bit later on um, once you know the blogging team is done with them and mm. I think that's a good option as well to if people also can't necessarily get the data to watch um, videos they could also have the option to to read mm. um, and you know potentially I think there could be an if we had like good transcribing <laughs> um, if we had like good um, you know, the, the, the like machine learning type virtual uh, thing, transcribing things where the person mm -hmm. is talking and the, the computer can just like uh, write down what the person is saying. I am a, I don't remember what that's called. But having that would maybe make it even better if the bloggers could already have like a transcript of what the person is saying. I think that would be great to even make it easier for, for the bloggers um, so yeah, those would be my, my ideas. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I really love the idea of live transcription. It's invaluable. Um, thank you for sharing, Marlene. Um, Naomi, I'd like to throw a slightly different question at you in the interest of time. Um, how can we make online learning um, and events and you know conferences like this and other interactions online more inclusive for um, people from 
uh, who are not native English speakers? Yeah, so I mean, I was mentioning earlier, uh, you know, text-based stuff is great so that people don't have to do the listening and the translating in their head in real time. I think that something that, that what Marlene's talking about, all these ideas are, are fantastic. And I'd love to find a way where people could really hone in on the value of a conference where you've got different people in the room like we are right now, right? So if everyone's come having watched the pre-recorded talk in or read the blog or whatever, mm -hmm. so you've had that pre uh, learning um, and then you're in this space together but in a way that you can actually share information um, uh, like inclusively so right now there's people who aren't who might not be able to be here but would have things to add in but we're not like here in the same time um, so I don't really know how to get to that um, one thing that I think is really helpful is adding closed captioning yeah, to your videos, but I, from my experience, the auto stuff is not there. Um, you do need to go back in and check. It will pick up a Westerner's yeah. voice very well. It does not pick up anything with an accent or English spoken with a different accent. Um, and I think it's, you know, it's a disservice to some people if you don't go in and, and actually improve that. Um, and I've shared in the chat a link to this resource. Um, it's not for me, it doesn't list all the features you might be interested in in terms of tools, but I think it's an interesting way to think about which tools give you phone dial-in options as well. Uh, so people can listen with audio if they can't do it over data. Um, uh, and also thinking about firewalls and which countries have ways around some of the um, access problems to different technologies that you might present a barrier to because of the geographies of internet. Um, so I think, I mean, I think it's an active discussion and I don't have answers, but I think it's a great question. Yeah. Um, thank you so much, Naomi. Um, I really appreciate Mark, uh, Mark's comment about, you know, the issue of repurposing funds not always being possible and especially in institutions like universities. Um, and so I think um, if you are in a position where you have, you know, budget and funds and can allot them for you know funding such um such events and uh, opportunities in communities you should definitely open up those funds um but we should also continue sharing these opportunities for funding as we come by them um because i think funders are beginning to you know see new needs and um, speak to them so there's this funding opportunities in different ways and if we can share them with each other in our communities um, then people can find the right funding to, to enable their work, their events. Um, so community work continues. Thank you, Mark, for that comment. Um, so we are almost out of time, I think. Um, I have two more questions. Um, and thank you for everyone who's commenting in chat and sharing links. Before I forget, if, if someone can volunteer to move um, all the links into the etherpad so we don't lose them, I'll really appreciate that. Um, so two last questions for our panelists. And <clears throat> the first one is um, looking into the future. So post Carpentry Con at home, what is a resource or two that you would wish existed, um, you know, or that was present for the next conference uh, to help address the theme of our conference? Um, so the theme of this conference has been um, growing inclusive computational communities and leaders. Um, so what didn't we have this time around that you think would have been really great um, and we should think about having for future conferences around a theme like this? So you can choose to answer that question or you can um, speak to how we as a community and as community members can continue to grow inclusive computational communities and leaders beyond carpentry con yeah so a wish list or you know <laughs> your parting shot for how we can continue to build computational communities and leaders um i think we can start with toby ah uh, um the resource one, I don't, I'm not sure I, it's hard, this is a hard question. Um, mm. I think that the thing that I wish was more widely adopted that does mm -hmm. exist already mm -hmm. is the, um, what we've referred to at Carpentry's events, at least as the Pac-Man rule. 
uh, of making sure that there's always a gap in your circle when you're standing there talking to people. I mean, all of this is like, now I'm being optimistic and talking about a time when we're all actually able to stand that close to each other again. And there's not just like 1.5 meter gaps between all of us. Um, but I also, I think that if we're talking about the virtual events, then really finding this platform that works properly to recreate that kind of breakout like coffee break session mm -hmm. that you get at conferences um where everyone can kind of mingle and find conversations that they want to join and i know mm -hmm. the, some of the folks involved with the cscce who we're mentioning a lot today um they have like playing around with a bunch of these different platforms that are already out there but um mm. i've yet to have been told about one that really seems to have nailed it and i hope we're going to get there um for my response to the other question mm -hmm. you'll just have to go watch the video recording from last <laughs> night's session good toby Thank you. Um, I really appreciate what you've mentioned. Um, and I think it's something we didn't get to discuss today, but it's an open question I'd like to throw um, at everyone and we can continue this discussion either on Twitter or Slack. Um, the whole hallway track in in person conferences is it's such a great experience. You bump into people, you start chatting. By the end of the conference, you are collaborating on something or, you know, venturing out to do a whole project together. And, and that's something we don't quite get um, or that is harder to replicate in an online environment. So how can we bring that experience in online spaces? Um, we can chat about that. <laughs> it's, it's an open-ended question. Um, Steph. First, I would say the thing that you just brought up, Sarah, is exactly the thing that's most on my mind. Mm -hmm. And now that we have all of these wonderful options where I've been able to attend conferences that I would not normally and participate in Carpentry Con as an attendee in other sessions, it's on us as conference organizers to figure out what is it that we're going to do mm -hmm. in our little local community or a global community what is it that we're going to do that's going to make people want to attend ours? And that's an answer I don't have yet, but I think right. about a lot and I want to be organizing something, but I don't know what it's going to look like. Mm -hmm. um, and I guess in terms of growing and honestly, like this is something I'd love for everyone attending to kind of put in the chat, chime in ideas. Mm -hmm. Cause I feel like we need these things. Um, and in terms of like supporting and growing, inclusive communities and leaders. Uh, I'm putting in a plug, but I think it's something that it's, it's kind of important and Toby's brought this up is, you know, exposing uh, the things that you know and you feel about your community and helping people understand how they can participate mm -hmm. to make things more transparent and therefore accessible is this community contributing guide we just released day before yesterday from our open sci. And the idea is, um, telling people that, you know, if you want to spend 30 minutes contributing, here's an example of something you can do. And I actually got this idea from Toby. Um, and if you want to spend one hour contributing, if you want to spend five hours, you could do this. Or if you want an ongoing commitment, here's something you can do. And that's just like right in the introduction. That was Toby's advice. Right. But then we have a section that says like, okay, figure out what it is you want to get out of making a contribution and giving your time and experience and see if you recognize yourself in these I want to statements like, um, you know, I want to raise my profile in the R community. Well, okay, we give you some options. Maybe you'll write up, take 30 minutes to write up a use case of how you've used one of our packages, but we'll share that with our 30,000 Twitter followers and we'll tag you in it. So it's like sharing the gratitude and credit and recognition. And so in this guide, what we've tried to do is take all of the knowledge we have internally about our mm -hmm. organization and put it all out there for the first time and say, here's all the different ways that you can get involved and contribute. But we've taken away that barrier of, well, now you don't need to know me or someone else on the staff and feel yeah. like, oh, I can never contact this person. Mm -hmm. They're different or special. We're not different at all, but trying to make things transparent so that they can become accessible to a broader group of people 
um, mm. I think is really valuable. At the same time, it's a ton of work and not everyone, and especially somebody doing this in a volunteer capacity, like that's my job, I get paid to do that. Um, it's a bit of, it's too much to expect that anyone can do that, but it's something to aspire to. Yeah, I really like what uh, you, Steph, and Toby said yesterday. Um, build resources to empower people and then get out of their way. <laughs> so um, that's, that's a really great takeaway um, for all of us. Um, and then Marlene. Sure, these have been really great points. I think um, I'll comment on two things. So the first one would be um, in terms of interactivity, I, we used a platform uh, called Hopin Mm -hmm. um, for our conference recently and there's like a feature uh, in the app that has like a networking option yes. where you're randomly paired up with people and you can choose to like video chat or um, or use like uh, or you don't have to turn on your video but you can just talk um, that is very complicated because it can I mean they are that could go very wrong and I think we didn't think it through all the things that could go wrong, which is why we kind of left it on. But there was a very positive response to that. I think mm -hmm. a lot of people did enjoy it, but it's very, that's like a COC, that's a code of conduct nightmare waiting to happen, <laughs> maybe. Um, but we generally, I think there was a positive response for that. So if anyone wants to look into that, that, was, that worked quite well for us. Mm -hmm. um, and in terms of building uh, leaders in more inclusive communities, um, I know with the PSAF, we've been trying to see how, um, you know, the PSAF historically has been primarily a US-based European um, organization. And I think over recent years, there's been a push to really make the um, organization more global. And I think that's been quite, uh, that's something that we're trying to focus uh, on now. And mm -hmm. one of the key things I think to do that is make sure that leadership is inclusive. So leadership is representative of your global community. Um, so, you know, making sure you, you're hearing voices at the highest level from people around the world. And so we are trying to do that. It's difficult because the PSF uses a, a, a system where the members vote and currently the membership is primarily Western and, and American. And so mm -hmm. um, we're trying to figure out ways uh, to do that, but we are trying to be intentional. We created a work group that focuses specifically on trying to increase um, global diversity and inclusion. So um, I would say just being intentional about that and mm -hmm. it, something that's always good. Thanks, Marlene. Uh, that's a really important point about, you know, as is the nature of open communities to have consensus driven decision making. Uh, it's important to design ways that invite people in so that they're actually a part of that entire process. And that takes work, that takes time, it requires building trust. And so, you know, especially in situations where people need to vote, the work has to start way in advance, not in the last month uh, when, uh, yeah. So I, I really appreciate that. So we should think about that and intentionally work towards it. Thank you. Naomi, last but not least. <laughs> I think I just want to say that I've learned so much already from listening to um, the panelists and hearing what everyone's putting in the chat. Um, and just picking up on some of those points to answer this question, Marlene mentioned earlier, like, you know, having things available in different ways as a blog or as a video. And I think that multiplicity is really important. There's no, mm -hmm. there's never going to be one community framework that does this so right. Carpentries is fantastic. And there are other computational communities that also do things really well. And I think the more, the merrier. Um, uh, so, I guess it's, I mean, what Steph was saying about there's so many events and we've got to work out how, how can people come to ours? Mm -hmm. um, but there's also an element of transience that, you know, for a few years of your life, you're part of the carpentries and you move on and that's okay. Um, and I just think the more the merrier, just so that people can, um, ha you know, find their place at that point in time and have a generative contribution and experience. Um, uh, at the same time, I think there's so many 
there, there are several really good frameworks to build on. And I think that on my wish list is just more spaces like this. There are people on this call who, um, who have mentored me, people who I've mentored, people who I always go to with questions. And, and the learning that I get is always in the space in those interactions. And I think the more we can have places like this to ask questions and discuss them, mm. uh, the better because it's where that, that learning is really consolidated for me at least. Um, uh, so yeah, I think bringing all that together, I'd just like to say thank you for organizing this. <laughs> Hopefully we could all each go away with something we've learned and something we've given um, today. And I think that's like the real, the real classic. Mm -hmm. I completely agree, Naomi. And thank you so much for being a part of the panel. Um, so we have room for one question. Um, so please type type out hand in chat and I'll call on you. Um, but in case not, we are ready to close this fireside chat. Um, any questions? Um, okay, so before I hand this back to Christina, um, I have a request for everyone. Um, you've been to Carpentry Con sessions, at least you've been to one, this one, you're already here. Um, we have uh, an open question currently running in our community. We're thinking about the platforms that we use and employ um, for community interaction and collaboration, and um, especially the ways that some of these platforms limit people from specific countries um, or contexts um, from interacting or being a part of this community. Um, so if you have any um, information that could help us um, or add to this conversation, please feel free to contribute um, <clears throat> on GitHub or to send me an email on sarah at carpentries.org um, and we'll make sure that it's recorded. The idea is that once we get um, all this information together, we can start a discussion about where to go from here, how to make our community events um, and interactions more inclusive. So your input is highly appreciated. Thank you so much to our panelists for sharing all your experiences, your ideas, um, for, for being vulnerable with us, um, for saying, I don't know, to some of the questions we got, because you know we we are we are learning as we go along, and it's really it's really lovely to hear you know that you're also learning. Um, and so, thank you for coming, everyone. I will hand this back to Christina so that we can close this fireside chat. Thank you, Sarah. A big uh, everyone clap either in your video or on Zoom. Round of applause for our speakers. Um, thank you, Sarah, for organizing and being an incredible moderator. Thank you, Toby, Steph, Naomi, and Marlene for sharing your experiences. Um, this has been really, really wonderful. Uh, and especially in the light of so much that's going on, the on in the world, I think this is more important than ever. And it's really great to have a chance to sit and talk about it. So I'll turn off the recording.